level and then falling. It had been rising due to rising labor force participation rates of prime age women. Uh, it's been falling over the whole period for prime age men. So this is a huge uh, problem that's been getting a lot of publicity uh, and uh, some explanations have been provided, including the opioid uh, addiction, um, health problems, suicide in uh, this age group. We discussed that in the paper. Um, most economists and the Fed believe that what we face is supply constrained growth, and some people have started to talk again about secular stagnation. We had the same discussions in the early 1990s, uh, the first time <coughs> in the post-war period that people would return to this argument that maybe we can't grow like we did in the early post-war period because the um, uh, supply side of our economy can't generate the amount of growth that we used to have. So they point to the aging of the baby boomers, which I'm gonna come back to. There's a little bit of truth to that. Drug addiction, lack of the work ethic, growing disability rates, overly generous social safety nets, increased schooling, which keeps people out of the labor force for a longer period of time, and a wide variety of lifestyle choices. We discussed each one of these factors in the paper. Uh, I'm not gonna have time to go through all of those. But for example, there's a claim that uh, more people are staying out of the labor force voluntarily to take care of children and elder uh, family members at home. But when you actually look at the data, uh, the reduction of the labor force participation rates tends to be by single people, single males, uh, who don't have family members at home. So it actually doesn't explain uh, very much of this. And in fact, married couples with children have, have continued to have rising participation rates. So it doesn't really fit the lifestyle choices. Others have emphasized long-term secular stagnation both supply side and demand side. Uh, so Robert Gordon, who's a very well-known uh, Orthodox economist, um, ironically, whose brother was a radical left economist, and his parents were institutionalist economists who uh, Minsky had worked with when he was at Berkeley developing the employer of last resort proposal. But in any case, he's come out with a, a major book arguing that uh, it is largely lower productivity growth and the lack of uh, true technological innovations that generate growth that is the main problem generating secular stagnation. Many other people are focusing on uh, robots and la loss of manufacturing jobs, which is supposed to explain the declining labor force participation rates. And so the solutions are, well, this is as good as it gets. We might as well just settle for it um, and uh, give up on jobs and give a basic income guarantee. So anyway, we discuss all of these things. I'm not gonna have time to go into each one of them. With regard to the uh, aging problem, this does explain uh, some of the decline of the labor force participation rate. So it's because we have a very large cohort aging and retirement rates rise at the age about 50. So that uh, this explains some of the decline of the labor force participation rate. It's about half. We have two different ways of measuring this. And this is a new graph, I'm not exactly positive how Flavia did this one, but I expect some kind of a, a weighted average of the two measures that we have. Now, if it is supply side and lack of technology, aging of the population, well, these should be pretty common problems in the rest of the rich developed capitalist world. Uh, in fact, aging is a much bigger problem outside the United States 
in the other OECD nations. They're all older than we are and aging faster than we are because we have a lot more immigration and we have a lot of um, young immigrants um, who are coming here to work. So our, you would think our labor force participation rates would be higher and, uh, and in terms of growth would be doing better, but actually we're near the very bottom. So on the level, we are the red over there on the left-hand side. We're one of the worst in terms of our overall labor force participation rate. And in terms of the change over the past uh, year since 1990, uh, we're one of the few that actually had a falling labor force participation rate. So if it really was coming from aging and lack of technological growth, I mean, because technology spreads pretty quickly, uh, it's very hard uh, to believe that that is the problem. It, it's concentrated in um, just a handful of countries. Is the labor market um, tight? Well, good uh, neoclassical theory tells you that a tight labor force ought to raise wages, which is why the Fed is worried about inflation and beginning to raise interest rates again. Um, on the left-hand side, we've got um, the nominal hourly wage growth. It has picked up, but it's picked up from a very low rate of growth in the recovery since the global financial crisis. So it does not look like the labor markets are uh, very tight. On the uh, right-hand side, uh, this is a, a picture very similar to the one that Rick Wolf uses in his talks has been going around the country uh, talking about this uh, long-term trend with rising labor productivity and relatively stagnant real wages. Again, good neoclassical theory tells you that as labor becomes more productive, the real wage should rise in step with that. But in reality, they have diverged since the early 1970s, he has a graph where he plots it far back in time, and generally they had increased together. They no longer do. So again, we don't see evidence that we have tight labor markets, which should be closing that gap, and it's not. Another picture, employment cost index. So again, the cost of hiring, total cost of hiring employees is not rising much. Uh, labor share of value added, so if you think of the capital versus labor share, it continues to go down. Again, not consistent with the argument that labor markets are tight. So all of that really is in the first paper. That one's already published at Central EV Institute. I think that it's something like the end of 2016 uh, is when uh, we finished that one. The new paper is uh, not finished yet. It'll be up at least soon. Um, we're looking at uh, the employer of last resort or job guarantee program and trying to get an estimate of how many people uh, would take up an offer of a job to anybody who wants to show up to work. Uh, and I think all of our assumptions are very consistent with what Scott is is using in the simulation. So here, we're just trying to get an idea of how many people would go into the program, and uh, then we do a little bit of analysis, what impacts it would have. Scott's gonna do a full simulation. So uh, we um, adopt Minsky's version of employer of last resort based on the WPA. You take workers where they are, as they are, jobs and projects in every community, not just infrastructure. I made a comment earlier today that uh, infrastructure, we are a service sector economy. Most of the jobs have to be in the service sector and uh, that uh, won't lead to a gender bias. Uh, only the federal government can afford it, so the assumptions we use are the program wage is set at $15 per hour. Of course, it, there's a $15 minimum wage campaign. Uh, we have full-time and part-time employment um, available on demand. Non-wage compensation is set at 20% of the wage costs. The benefits include paid leave and retirement, child and healthcare benefits, 
program administration materials costs are set at about 25% of wages. Uh, this is pretty typical in job creation programs. Um, and additional administrative materials and capital costs, if any, are assumed to be absorbed by the employers. So this morning, uh, I said that we would allow uh, non-governmental entities to offer jobs. We just ask them how many people can you take if we will pay the wages plus the benefits and some administration material costs. You have to cover any additional costs of hire. So that's the idea. So the question is, how many people are gonna accept this offer? We had two ways of calculating it, and fortunately, they come to about the same answer. We actually didn't even have to rig it. They, <laughs> they come to about the same answer. And, and Scott came to about the same answer using a different methodology. Okay. So the first is we um, look at the, the classification. So the BLS asks people, uh, did you work for one hour in the past two weeks? If so, you're employed. Okay, we look at the employed, uh, the official unemployed, and then the out of the labor force population. Okay, and um, uh, get an estimate of how many from each one of these categories will flow into the program. Right. Um, the uh, on the the unemployed, uh, we assume uh, that they will flow in. Okay. The employed we have to make some further assumptions about how many people who are already employed will jump ship into this program. We're paying $15 an hour. Now, we assume that employers who retain their workers are going to match it. Okay. Uh, but uh, the, um, uh, some of the uh, workers are going to, uh, are already um, working below minimum wage. So we're assuming that they will jump ship, definitely. And then the out of the labor force populations. So we have to get, break that down into further categories uh, and assume that some of those will go in and some won't. The other is to raise the uh, labor force participation rate of all uh, groups with different levels of educational attainment to the partic participation rate of college graduates. There's a very big difference in labor force participation rate between college graduates and let's say high school dropouts. Uh, and there are some arguments as that are plausible that college graduates are more oriented to being in the labor force than people with lower levels of educational attainment. And so we admit that. But on the other hand, um, economic necessity is greater for people with lower levels of educational attainment than it is for college graduates because they come from different backgrounds. Okay, and so uh, our assumption is that these two uh, sort of motivational factors balance one another. And so there's no reason to suppose uh, ex ante that college graduates are more motivated to get jobs than people with lower levels of educational attainment. So there is a screening that prevents them from obtaining jobs. So that's our assumption. So we're going to raise participation <coughs> rates for all groups up to college level and see how many of those. I'm not gonna go through these tables, you probably can't see them anyway. Uh, so here are the number moving from unemployed uh, into the job guarantee pool. We have a, a high estimate okay, where we assume uh, that uh, more of them will go in. Keep going, please. Okay, and a, a lower <laughs> estimate uh, where fewer of them take it up we get between 2.6 and 5.1 million who move from unemployed into the job guarantee program. From the employed, uh, we have um, people who have low wages 
and also involuntary part-time workers. The majority of the people who are gonna move into the Job Guarantee Program uh, are part-time workers. So that's about uh, 6.4 million, um, and then there are 221,000 who are working at or below the minimum wage to the their employers are not going to match the job guarantee wage. And then finally, those who move from out of the labor force into the job guarantee program, um, that is estimated to be um, 4.8 to, no, 4.8 million. So total, we get between 11 and a half million at the low end to 17 and a half million at the high end. Uh, this changed a lot between January and July. When we first did the estimates, it was uh, between 15 and 20 million. It has dropped to 11 and a half to uh, 17 and a half million. This gives us some idea of the impact of the cyclical growth that we had during the first half of this year. It actually pulled more people into the private sector and reduced the size of the job guarantee. And I think uh, Scott has some uh, cyclical effects too. The other way is to raise uh, labor force uh, participation rates and the employment population ratio. And we get an upper bound of 20 million. But this is for 2016. So it's in the same ballpark as our uh, January estimates using the other method. Okay, and then just a, a, a couple of um, uh, analyses of the impact uh, on the labor force. So here's the demographic composition of the uh, the people who move into the program. Um, I'll just highlight again, not everything. Uh, you will see that uh, job guarantee uh, program workers are disproportionately uh, African American and Hispanic compared to the percent of the population. So the, this program um, is uh, providing uh, relatively more jobs to groups that are relatively disadvantaged uh, in uh, the private sector, which is exactly what you would expect. We also looked at the impacts on poverty. Uh, if you look at those living below the poverty line, and, and someone mentioned uh, at an earlier panel that of course the poverty line is far too low. Uh, it's not a realistic, uh, uh, line in terms of your standard living and so on, but we're using the official poverty line. Uh, if you look at uh, individuals between the ages of 18 and 64, about 31% of them have no work. So not having a job, surprisingly enough, uh, <laughs> tends to increase your probability of being poor. Um, for children, it's much, much worse. Families with no workers, have poverty rates of 90% for their children. So it's devastating to families uh, with children to have no work. The Job Guarantee Program uh, at $15 an hour is gonna give you $31,000. This is for one worker in your family. That is enough to lift families with up to five people in them out of poverty. One job, one full-time job, per family will lift a family of five above the poverty line. So looking at child poverty, um, we estimate that if you have one member of your household, you're gonna move 10.6 million children under the age of 18 out of poverty. If two members worked, you would move 14.6 million children. Well, sorry, one member works full-time, one member works part-time, you'll move um, 14.6 million children out of poverty. So it's an extremely effective anti-poverty program, uh, while uh, the war on poverty was a very ineffective method of raising people out of poverty uh, because it was too stingy. With decent pay, one job, 
we do. And two jobs will raise most kind of income. Minsky uh, wrote a lot on poverty and unemployment, mostly in his Berkeley years. He was at UC Berkeley, which had a very strong institutionalist tradition in um, labor. And we collected all of those in uh, this book published a few years ago, Ending Poverty, Jobs, Not Welfare. And I recently had a book, uh, which had, I think is chapter four, which um, lays out his uh, job guarantee book. Thank you. Anyway, so my role in this was is to simulate the program. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with some of the stuff I've done on this in the past, but I've, I've published two papers in the past that have simulated this. This, far and away though, has way more bells and whistles than anything I've simulated before. Usually when I would do this, I'd have to throw in somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 equations related to the program, and this one is more like 50 that I had to play around with. So anyway, I'm gonna be using a model called the FAIR model, which some of you may have heard of. Um, why the FAIR model? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First off, um, it is available, <laughs> and it is a, it's a large model. But I'll, I'll go through this a little bit, but it's 130 equations, the US version. He has an international, there's an international version but um, it hasn't been updated since 2013, so I did use that in the paper that I published in 2013. But um, anyway, designed by Ray Fair at Yale University, uh, started it about 72, 1972, something like that. Uh, so it's, it's been around for quite a while. Anyway, it's, as I'll, as I'll get into here in a second, it's a, a, a fairly Keynesian model of the economy. It has a lot in common, as I'll get into, with, with some of the more uh, the, the, uh, stock flow consistent models you see in, in post Keynesian economics, with one big difference, which is it's actually fit to data, okay, which you almost, you almost never see with the uh, stock flow consistent models, not because they're not good at it, but because it's really hard. And so to find a model that has done all of that and has a number of characteristics that you think are reasonable, um, that's useful. There's one other thing, which is I have a little bit of a competitive advantage with this model because um, the program that Rayfair designed to run it in, you can actually run it in eViews, but you get a lot more bells and whistles if you run it in the program that Rayfair designed, but that program runs in DOS, and I'm old enough to know how to do DOS, so. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we'll go through this a little bit here. Um, anyway, these, these aren't great PowerPoints, but uh, <coughs> just needed to put together some things uh, for you to look at and so I wouldn't forget. But as I said, 130 equations, 30 of them are stochastic, which means we're re running regressions, we're statistically estimating. Those are, the, those are the core things going on in the economy. The other 100 identities uh, relate to, in particular, the national income and flow fund accounts, which are, uh, nearly entirely integrated. So again, it's fit to data, not just uh, you know, not just uh, unemployment or something like that. But it's fit to the actual national income accounts, flow of fund accounts that are uh, increasingly significant, particularly for heterodox economists. Uh, he's got five sectors, as you can see there. The reason I put down the equate this the spending equations, supply equations, and the numbers there is because he's got about three or four times as many things going on in each of those sectors as, say, the traditional dynamic stochastic general derivative models. So he's got three consumption equations, right? He's got durables, non-durables, and services. Um, two investment equations, as it says there. He's got three labor force equations. He finds that you, in order to really predict, predict the labor force, you need 
the men 25 to 55, women 25 to 55, and you need another foot for everybody else, um, or that you're not really capturing that. Um, and then he has, for each sector, he's got a jobs equation, hours per week, and, and so forth. So that's it. The, the central bank is in there because he's fit, uh, he's fit the data to a, a Federal Reserve interest rate rule. He's got government purchases, he's got the actual tax rates embedded in there, um, and he's got payroll taxes as well, uh, corporate taxes, um, and one thing I didn't put in, he's got the transfers in there as well. Okay. Anyway, it's, as I said, it's a structural Keynesian model, which in our field, uh, particularly in the neoclassical world, it gives people quite a bit of pause. Uh, but the other thing about the Fair model, it's been around a long time, he's published <coughs> stuff on this, he's published studies using this model in virtually all of the big time journals. So it's not like it's not a respected model, but there is obviously controversy in the field about that for reasons I won't get into, they're, they're pretty academic. But, uh, well, I guess I will a little bit with one line there. Um, the, the rest of the field, uh, generally thinks that you need to have these micro foundations within these models. Um, and uh, structural models generally don't do that. They're much more of an aggregation, much more of a, a top-down view. Um, but those models have their own views. For instance, right, those are the models that a lot of folks are using. None of them saw, say, the financial crisis coming, et cetera, et cetera. So they have no financial system. That's kind of an issue. Um, <laughs> The other thing, fair model stability of structural equations, those, those 30 stochastic equations, he hasn't had to change them hardly at all in the last 45 years. So that tells you something. Over a series of business cycles and policy regime changes, he hasn't had to change very much of the model. Um, as I said, the stock, stock look consistent models are structural too, so people in the post Keynesian world shouldn't have a problem with it. Um, he's tested it against various other models, and it's, it's uh, done quite well, I'm not gonna go into those. He was able to, to in somewhere around 96, 97, um, from his model alone, uh, tell us that there was a stock market bubble because all of his structural equations were doing just fine, except for one, which is his stock market one, and it was completely underpredicting the stock market, and everything else was doing fine, so it sort of suggested him, obviously. Um, and then a lot of these traditional wealth multiplier effects that you have in these models that he gets are nearly identical to what the literature in those specific areas, you know, dozens and dozens of papers he studied, uh, should be happening. So anyway, um, and then this is one of the really terrible slides, but this is a number of things going on in the model that from a, the perspective that we take, we would like to see in a model, right? As I said, national income product accounts He's got expectations, they're not the rational expectations kind. Again, I don't want to get into too much technicality there. Nominal rates rather than real rates drive spending, and he's done a lot of empirical research on that one. There's no natural rate of unemployment, non-accelerated inflation, meaning you get unemployment down to, you know, a little bit below uh, what you think the natural rate is, and you're not gonna get inflation going 10, 20, 30, 40, 50%. You'll get some inflation, but um, you won't get the uh, uh, sort of crazy sort of thing that you see in um, uh, neoclassical textbooks. And um, Priestler and Lavoie basically have the same, uh, come to the same conclusions, and they cite a number of Fed studies that come to the same conclusions as well, that are exactly uh, consistent with what Fair's doing with his inflation uh, estimations, his estimated equations. There's no loanable funds uh, market, um, which we like the, um, let's see, it's got kind of a markup pricing in the price level, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it spent, invest, this one seems so rational unless you're an economist. Investment spending is driven by sales. Firms expand capacity when they have the sales to do that. I, I know economists have a really hard time believing that that's what happens, but it is. So, okay. Um, so the simulated job guarantee. So uh, Randy was talking about, uh, was, was walking you through those categories within the uh, current population survey and where they thought the jobs would come from. Uh, so I did, I have essentially the same thing. So I have uh, part-time for economic reasons. So I have a higher bound one and a lower bound. You had two of each, I just have one of each. Um, but uh, part-time for economic reasons. And there's a couple of other things that are in the part-time, the UWFT and the child, uh, that go in the higher bound. Um, 
The last one for each, we had two different views on the uh, who's coming out of the, who from the unemployed, the officially unemployed are coming into the program. One of them was based on duration, one of them was based on, what was it, temporary or not temporary, I can't remember exactly what that was. Yeah, anyway, so the one that was based on duration is the one in the lower bound, meaning have you been unemployed for more than five weeks? Uh, and the other one's based on everybody who's, I think it was unemployment less laid off temporarily. That's the, I guess it says it right there. That's it, yeah. yeah. And so then, um, and then we have the people who say they'd like a job, but they haven't been looking. Um, anyway, so those are the uh, two categories went out and got essentially the same data. There were, there were some little differences because you did, you did uh, two of each, higher bound, lower bound. Okay, um, so I ran regressions for each of these because these are not in the FAIR model. The FAIR model does the official unemployed. I didn't want that. I wanted a bigger number of folks. But what I had to do is I had generated internally in the FAIR model, endogenously. So I had to take the variables in the FAIR model to uh, predict effectively how many people how many people go into the model. So to make a long story short, I essentially took in that third bullet uh, private sector jobs, hours, average work per quarter, labor force participation, production, unemployment rate, et cetera, et cetera. And those actually gave me really nice fits most of the time for those. Um, and and generally what you would have expected, how you would have expected uh, those categories on the previous page to move with those variables. But Within the fair model, you're generating those things every single quarter, so it was, um, so then you can have these. So anyway, um, in the interest of time, I'll just move on a little bit. So uh, the program, pretty much what Randy had, $15 an hour, 20 hours per week on average for the part-time workers, full-time workers, 40 hours per week on average. Um, so what you end up with basically is the average was about 32 to 33. In that range. Um, so non-labor costs, we added 25%. Uh, these are purchases by the government from the firm sector. We had benefits package, which was another 20%. Uh, split evenly between purchases from the firm sector, healthcare, childcare, and transfers to the household sector paid tax. Um, JG, job guarantee employees, some of them are going to pay, well, they're going to pay the employee portion of the payroll tax. Put that in there. Um, and then had to make an assumption there. So uh, and we're trying to hit it at the, we're trying to be low here so we make the program um, as we're biased towards the towards making the program look expensive. Okay, we don't want to be accused of trying to make it look uh, uh, inexpensive, right, to, to, the, to fit what we'd like it to look like. So. Anyway, so we assume about a third of the income earned in the program will be taxed as an income tax. Um, let's see. So some of them would be eligible for unemployment benefits. I mean, you could have different job guarantee programs and just say no more unemployment benefits. But what we did was we basically said, well, let's just say unemployment benefits are reduced 25%. And I think that makes the program look more expensive <coughs> than it otherwise would be, again, having that bias there. Medicaid expenditures should fall. Well, how much should they fall, right? Uh, federal government last year spent $350 billion on Medicaid. And so we actually just assumed, I think the alt, alt N number was like about 10% of that, which it might be way more than that because all of a sudden you have, pretty much every poor person can get a job and get health insurance. So we'd probably replace the vast majority of that Medicaid spend, um, but I assumed it replaced somewhere in the neighborhood of 10% of that. So, um, and then we also did that at the state level, because state uh, states paid $200 billion last year for Medicaid. And, but we, we ratcheted that down. I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $9 or $10, $9 or $10 billion. So that's a gain that we cut from that. Same thing with earned income tax credit. Now we spend a lot less on those, but uh, we're still being very modest in how much uh, of those uh, expenditures we're assuming are um, reduced. So again, biased to the uh, erring on the side of the program looking more expensive. Okay, then the last thing we did is $15 an hour is obviously higher than the current minimum wage. So we had to do something about that. And there's one private sector wage in the FAIR model which covers all, um, 
all wages and salaries, but also non-wage benefits and things like that. So you go into the, if, if you have a job guarantee, say my salary isn't necessarily gonna change, right? But there are people that are in the private sector who, whose salaries probably wouldn't change. So you'd have to, you have to bump those salaries up a bit, right? So we basically said about 20% of the difference between the $15 job guarantee wage and I say 20, yeah, I said 20% of the difference between the job guarantee wage and the minimum wage and the benefits that the minimum wage workers receive, which isn't much, I assume, uh, would be passed through to the private sector wage. Again, I think we're erring on the side of making the program look like it's more inflationary in this case. Um, anyway, so, no, just keep going. so some results. Now, before I do this, um, we're, do, we're using the FAIR models forecast for 2017 to 2022. It's uninteresting to look at that forecast, okay? Uh, structural models converge to basically their trend within a few quarters, right? Um, so, well, most models do that actually, uh, whether they're structural or not. So that part is uninteresting. What's interesting is to see how you deviate from that path because you threw in a job guarantee. So one thing you won't see here is a, a, a cyclical component because it does have that convergence. You will see some things that look kind of uh, stabilization-like. But the, the other thing that we're gonna do, because I've got a larger paper coming out on this, is going to also simulate this exact same thing, but in the 2009 through 2016 period. So you will see sort of a, a big recession and then a recovery and what the job guarantee does with that. So, and that actually, that'll actually look even better for us in terms of macroeconomic outcomes than what you'll see here, which is still pretty good. Um, anyway, so what you're gonna see, everything you can see is the differences from uh, the simulation width of job guarantee and that fair model base forecast. Okay, so just those differences. Okay, so this is the number of jobs that you have. So you have the high and low. We phase this in over five quarters because it kind of disrupts the model to solve it, to just all of a sudden do it in one quarter. So we, we phase it in about 20% each quarter. So you can see we go up to about, what, 19 million with the higher bound and 15 and a half million, and then it sort of, it comes down, right? Because the private sector starts to do better as a result, and they pull some workers into the job. Okay, this is real GDP, and I normalized it to, with 2017 quarter one as the base. So you're getting somewhere in the neighborhood of $650 billion a year within two years, and then Tails off a bit to what, 500 billion, et cetera. So and these are real GDP numbers, not nominal. So when I get to the cost of the John guarantee, the spending, that's in nominal. So you don't want to compare it to these numbers necessarily. Uh, I'll tell you what the comparison is actually when I get there. Okay. Um, here's something that's interesting the private sector will create jobs in response to the economy doing better. Right? So you have the private sector creating nearly four, three to four million jobs on average a year, additional jobs, as a result of the fact that there are people earning $30,000 a year, et cetera, and spending in the economy. Um, one-off effect. Yeah, this is basically a one-off effect, right? And so it kind of stabilizes right there in three, where am I, three to three and a half million range, depending on if you're in the long, or the high or the lower bound. Okay. Inflation, what happens to inflation? People always say, oh, that'll be so inflationary if you do that, right? Um, so, employing 19, 15 to 19 million people at a living wage with 25% spent on uh, non-labor cost, 20% benefits package, at its peak adds a little bit less than one percentage point to inflation. And then that tails off to be macroeconomically insignificant, right? which is what we've been saying would happen for 20 years, and it's what's happened every time you've simulated it in any model. So it's, uh, you know, if, if you put it in, the economy's gonna do better for a while while you're, while you're implementing it, but that one-time increase in inflation, which itself is not a big deal, the Fed would love to have 1%, one percentage point more inflation um, than it's had on average the last seven or eight years. So anyway, so the program, at least in these simulations, is not inflation. Okay, spending. Here's the spending on the program. Um, let's see, I'm happy to do that. Okay, so you've got the high on the left and the low on the right. The uh, 
The first one you're seeing is the direct spending. So the higher bound one, about $650 billion, the lower bound one, what's it done? What, 530, something like that, okay? So not a super expensive program, certainly less than the, what, two trillion in the, the um, basic income simulations that you get, and those weren't even in an above poverty uh, level transfer. So anyway, now what's the next number? The next number is, what, what is the actual effect on the government's budget? Okay, because some of these people are paying taxes, they're creating more economic activity, et cetera, et cetera. You're reducing unemployment benefits. What's the net effect? So the actual budgetary effect is significantly less, right? For the higher bound program, 500 and some billion, and for the lower bound, four. Am I right? I'm saying that right? $400 billion. Okay. Now, additionally, and I did this as a percent of GDP now, so you have the same two things you saw here, the first two, but now they're in percent of GDP terms. So 3% of GDP, it's not an expensive program to employ 19 million people, 18 to 19 million people. Um, and of course the budgetary effect is more like two, right? But then the other one is we take out the effects of the additional debt service from the program because the fair model is assuming the government's its trend has the government already in a deficit. So when you add in the job guarantee, the deficit gets even bigger, and so there's additional debt service for that. What if the government wasn't in a deficit, right? Well, if the government wasn't in a deficit, then the one in the middle is gonna be the more applicable one. So the point being, uh, in the real world, you're probably gonna end up somewhere in between the second and third, uh, rather than just the middle one. Okay, we can talk about that one a little bit more if we need to. Um, now, the other thing is, this is going to help the state level budgets, right? Because there's more activity, they spend less on Medicaid, they pay less in earned income tax credit. So this is nominal in, in billions of dollars. And the really important thing about this is the state sector doesn't, they are not the currency issuers, right? And so what we saw when, in 2009, 2010, when we got the Obama stimulus, which wasn't big enough anyway and not very well targeted, we saw the state sectors offsetting that quite a bit by cutting their budgets or raising their taxes. This actually, and what you'd, what you'd see with this is it would have the same nice counter cyclical properties if I simulated it from the business cycle when I do that. Um, this would uh, re reduce the need for the state's uh, level to um, worsen recessions because they would have additional income coming in and actually the most income coming in from this program when the economy is at its worst. Okay. Uh, so summing up, simulation suggests the program pays a, pays a living wage, provides healthcare benefits, employs 14 to 19 million beeper people, beeper, people, my cuss, 1.6 to 3% of GDP, where the program falls within this range, depends on how large it is, um, how the Fed reacts. I actually didn't have the Fed turned on, so the Fed's not doing any of the stabilization. In fact, when I turn the Fed on, everything gets worse. Because, <laughs> because the Fed's reacting to inflation, thinking it needs to slow inflation down by reacting to the fact that the economy's doing better. But what happens is, I didn't put it here, but in the larger paper, you can, you can see it. Um, infl the Fed does nothing to inflation, exactly what you guys were saying this morning. The Fed doesn't really control inflation, it's what it does. But it's raising interest rates because it thinks the economy doing better is going to create inflation. What it really does slows the economy down, sends more people into the job guarantee. And so then what you get is a more expensive program. So if Fed stays out, it's a much less expensive program and actually has a better macroeconomic effect. Okay. Um, raise real GDP. Let's see. Private sector, we talked about that. Uh, effect on inflation is macroeconomically insignificant. Um, state level budgets would improve and then lastly I had some thing on the um, effect of the Fed I think in the interest of time I'll just leave that out I think that was my last slide so okay I'll stop there
contribution to this project is basically to answer the perennial questions but what are the jobs in, you know we've answered these many many times um, and in in this particular paper I'm not only synthesizing work that we have done so far but also adding uh, some new uh, frames institutional design features just trying to create a blueprint so people can visualize how this can be put in place for the United States and what it might look like. Now, um, but I, I wanna first start with the question, is it time? Well, yes, of course, we, we think it's time. Uh, it's, you know, past uh, due, uh, but I wanted to give you some um, statistics on American attitudes towards job creation. Um, the job guarantee, I, I would say, is relatively new in the uh, uh, public's opinion, even though we've been working on it forever. And uh, you know, certainly, job government job creation programs have not, you know, are, are quite old. But the job guarantee proposal, I think, got its uh, uh, inauguration in the Rolling Stone magazine piece by Jesse Myerson, if he is here. Um, he wrote something, uh, a piece called Five uh, Economic Reforms Millennials Should Support. And the first one that he proposed was his job guarantee, and then he proposed for others um, a basic income guarantee, land value tax, uh, sovereign funds, um, public banking, I think, right? I think these were the, these were the five. Um, and that was, and so YouGov ran a survey on this article because it created a lot of debate and discussion in the media. Um, and so um, the question that was asked is, would you favor or oppose a law guaranteeing a job to every American adult with the government providing jobs for people who can't find employment in the private sector? Um, at, at the time, 47% of, of uh, respondents said that they will support it. 12% uh, were unsure. So in my book, well, let's just educate them. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, this was the first introduction of, of the, the policy. The second one was the basic, the second most popular uh, reform was the basic income guarantee. But Jesse is a very smart man. He didn't call it universal basic income guarantee. He called it a social security program for all. Of course, Social Security is the most popular American program we have so far. And even though it was presented this way, it was still um, only 35% of respondents favored uh, the basic income guarantee proposal. So it was, you know, just a second. Now, there, uh, there is um, lots of other research on uh, attitudes. Uh, this particular paper does a survey of various it's a collection of various surveys, old or new, on job creation programs. And um, they ask the specific question whether you uh, favor the government to be the employer of last resort, essentially, providing, again, um, uh, jobs to anyone who cannot find it uh, in the private sector. They find 53% uh, favorability. Oh, sorry. This is, the, uh, this is the basic income difference between the job guarantee and the basic income and Jesse's fees. And the next one is the uh, American Attitudes by um, uh, this study. And all of this is, by the way, in my paper, which is gonna be also on the Levy, uh, on the Levy website. And I also should say that apart from trying to like, present a blueprint and a vision of, of this proposal, I have like a frequently asked questions appendix, which has grown to like 50 questions now, but hopefully it will be like an evolving document where we will continuously update it and answer questions that, that, that come up. But, um, this study shows that the majority of Americans are um, supporting the job guarantee. What was very interesting in this study is that they updated it later, and they also wanted to check the attitudes of um, the general public and uh, the high-income households. As you will notice, high-income households, only 8% of them support the job guarantee. So this is a, a, a bit of a, oops, a little bit of the, uh, a little bit of the challenge before us. Now the, this, uh, there were two different types of questions that were being asked. Um, one is a more general question that you see in a lot of surveys, whether the, you know, Washington should see to it that anyone who wants a job can find it. That's not quite the question of a job guarantee. Um, the job guarantee is this, you know, directly providing the job. So 53% support 
job guaranteed, work last resort, 68% um, uh, support government involvement. And so actually support for government involvement in job creation programs is uh, relatively strong. In uh, 2013, Gallup uh, also asked a couple of questions uh, whether the federal government um, should spend money to put people to work on urgent infrastructure repairs and whether the federal uh, job create, whether we should pass a law, a federal law, that will spend money on employing, uh, on, on creating more than on creating more than one million new jobs. And this is 72% of respondents supported both of these questions. So so as we think about a job guarantee, it's no surprise that people keep talking about infrastructure because they seem to be very popular. But again, I think this, you know, we, we have to start educating the public on, on, on sort of the merits of, of these various design features. There is a long-standing survey on the Kinder uh, Houston area, and actually I got this from uh, Jeff. <laughs> you pointed uh, this link to me, and I found this study, and then I, I looked it up, and, and this study has been running since um, 86, I want to say. It's been, uh, for a very long time in the Houston area, they've been asking these questions about you know, people's attitudes towards different government programs, and there's one question that says, again, that the government should see to it that everyone who wants to work can find a job. Again, more than 60% popularity support for, for government involvement in solving the problem of unemployment since the late 80s. But interestingly, after the great financial crisis, the, the popularity of this approach increased with, uh, you know, in 2006, it was far, people actually supported it more than they supported in 2011 or in 2009, right after the crisis. So I think that um, the American public is ready. Now, as we begin to think about how we're going to um, uh, how we're going to design the policy, I think it's very important that we have the conceptual understanding correct. Like the institutional design has to be informed by the premises, the first premises that uh, that we use in, in explaining theoretically and, uh, the problem of unemployment. I'm not going to run through these because you're you're familiar with uh, with these. Let me see. Uh, I feel like I have to do that. It's fine. <laughs> the computer. The computer. So, uh, I've just very briefly, I, I, I gave a talk yesterday and I ran through these. But um, again, the motivation here is that since it is largely a, a government created problem, uh, it is incumbent on the public sector and the government to resolve the problem it has created. And the current ways in which it goes about to address uh, unemployment are uh, ineffective. So, um, uh, so some of the first premises are that this is a problem by design, that it cannot be remedied by private firms, and that indeed, you know, unemployment in the United States simply is a pool of people without jobs that fluctuate for the purposes of stabilizing the economy and inflation, I, I think that there's a sort of profound, you know, uh, implications of this. And we talk in such um, uh, euphemistic terms about unemployment and NIRU, you know, these benefits of stabilizing. But really, we're talking about a, a group of people that you know are laid off in mass and sort of rendered disposable in recessions, and then. You know, we do what we can to bring them back into uh, uh, paid employment. So, the the frame that I am adding to this discussion is uh, based on another paper that I read. Uh, I, I I completed for Levy a, a few months ago, and that's unemployment as a silent epidemic. This uh, frame I think is useful first to understand the phenomenon of unemployment and the. Um, large social costs that it brings, but also it informs design, how we're going to go about and implement those projects. Um, just, you know, where will the jobs be? Uh, you know, in which communities are you going to create those jobs? We have plenty of data uh, to see um, where we have mass layoffs, those, you know, initial onsets of mass unemployment, but also, if you pay attention to how unemployment evolves over time, you see a very clear contagion effect that happens with a very clear geographic pattern. And so, you know, if we go ahead today and put in place 
uh, a job guarantee proposal, you know, I will isolate precisely the communities that have chronic unemployment, double digit unemployment, even in the best of times. And if we target those, presumably there will be some sort of preventative effect because we're going to be sort of tackling the source of the mass unemployment problem so it doesn't transmit to the periphery. Uh, it kind of stalls the avalanche effect. So uh, if, if this doesn't quite make sense, uh, just, just go on YouTube and click on the map of unemployment and lo watch an animation of how unemployment behaves. I think that it's a very strong visual that can teach us how do we go about and target the job creation uh, proposal. It is a universal proposal, but you have to begin somewhere, right? Um, okay, so then uh, what are, I don't know why this is here. Then what are the objectives? You know, objective number one is that to provide decent jobs at decent pay on demand to all individuals of legal working age who want to work irrespective of labor market status, race, sex, color, and creed. And you know, the job guarantee is always, um, you know, have, the job guarantee always has to clear this enormous standard of solving all sorts of social problems. And, and we do talk about the benefits of the, this approach, that there are enormous benefits to this approach. But our objective number one is guaranteeing decent jobs at decent pay. There are then um, additional objectives, um, and from here, uh, they, those additional objectives are basically situated within a, a narrative of, of how we understand the problem of unemployment, how we understand the right to a job as a basic human right. And so it, it is going to be part of the objective of the policy to guarantee that, that right to people, and it does so by implementing unemployment safety net. Thank you. Just capture everyone uh, who, who needs a job, not through un income support, but also through job support. Um, okay, and so there are other things, you know, the objective is to be targeted, to create job opportunities in close proximity to the unemployed, to create suitable work opportunities for people with varied skills, to serve the public purpose, to create an employment buffer stock, um, establish a minimum wage, all of the things that have been discussed so far. Uh, but again, I want to emphasize that this policy uh, will serve as a preventative policy that inoculates against the, the large social and economic and political costs of unemployment. So you can use it as a tool. This is your institution. You have a problem to solve. You have other multiple deprivations to solve. Use the job guarantee to address those multiple deprivations. Do you have areas that have you know, a, a lack of um, healthy food? Use the job guarantee to provide it. So uh, again, we're not saying we're gonna solve all social problems, but it is our institutional vehicle that in its design will be mindful of addressing other social ills, which inherently is going to happen because they are connect connected. You know, communities with mass unemployment have multiple social deprivations. So we can uh, match those concerns. Um, uh, key, key program features, what do we insist on as we design it? We insist that this is a permanent program. We do not want this to be a crisis um, resolution program. They are very popular and quickly phased out. Uh, we insist that this is a voluntary program, that we are not going to take your other benefits and force you to come in to uh, work in this program. And we insist that it is an open door policy. We will provide jobs to anyone who wants it. We will not turn uh, anyone away. We insist that this is a federally funded program for it to be successful, um, as uh, we have discussed the fiscal space for the government uh, is fundamentally different. Uh, we, um, uh, we want it to be locally administered and target and establish an above poverty pay with uh, a, a possible goal of a living wage. Again, it's not a work fair program, but also, um, we envision it as a preparedness response, right? We, we design it, we plan it, it is, we provide on-demand uh, jobs uh, as people seek uh, work. And I'm gonna give some ex examples of how I, I see this preparedness response. This is a transitional job program. Of course, you can come in and work for a couple of months, you can transition out of it if you uh, find uh, other suitable employment. But I think we should have no illusions that for some people this will be the best option. 
and they may very well like this job. And so uh, it, we have to use both frames, that it is both a safety net, but it is also a stepping stone to other opportunities. And our vision is that it invests in the public good. And what that means to us is that we invest in people, invest in communities, and the environment. OK, so the paper goes to key benefits in situating this program in the broader progressive agenda. I'll skip that. Now, uh, OK, next. When you think about design, what the program is going to look like today is going to look very different from a program that has been in place and has been running for 10, 15 years. We have a very large problem to solve today, and it will require some amount of, of planning, but we know from experience that these programs can be up and running very quickly. Now, the New Deal programs were up and running in a few months, the Argentina program was up and running in four or five months, and they absorbed, um, you know, in Argentina, 13% of the labor force. An enormous problem. So I, I don't think we should, you know, uh, see this as an enormous problem, but because it is a permanent policy, we do want to think carefully and not just do it in an ad hoc emergency way and just create, create our preparedness response. So how do I see the preparedness response? We begin with uh, public jobs banks. Um, you know, we used to call those on the shelf projects. So let's retire that term because I think it's been corrupted from the Obama era a little bit. But essentially, that's what it is. We go out and talk to um, <coughs> providers in the community, uh, and we enlist them and say, if uh, we provide the funding and the resources, how many people do you need to do the things you want to need uh, to want want to do? Are there um, are there environmental you know, uh, uh, institutions like on the ground that do environmental work, but they need a lot of helping hands? Does the, the do the localities have um, problems that need to be addressed, but they don't have the budget, they don't have the people. Okay? We provide both. And so we go ahead and we enlist people with various types of, oppor uh, of projects and opportunities where um, essentially uh, you can go and pick from a menu of options, or we prioritize projects that need to be ramped up. Right? We have a massive unemployment problem, we, we have a massive community problem with urban blight and vacant properties and we need to do massive cleanup and rehabilitation. Let's just match those two. So that's what the Public Jobs Bank um, will essentially do. The second, and I'll talk a little more about how I, I see, uh, you know, which institutions might actually serve this purpose. Um, a key thing for us is the fin funding mechanism. Like how do we, you know, we talk about it's going to be federally funded, but what exactly are we talking about? Like how would the government actually go ahead and create and fund, you know, create a budget for a pro program like this? This is, I, I don't, I'm not saying I have, I have the answer and I'm very much open to like, you know, suggestions from, you know, people like Stephanie who have experience with the, you know, the budgeting process, etc. but we have, uh, the, the problem here is that we need to have the counter-cyclical function. We, we don't know how many people will show up at the office to seek work. Okay? And we need to pre prepare a budget that will allow um, the government to fund those people who are coming in. So I propose that we establish an unemployment relief fund that is you know, part of, let's say, the Department of Labor and that initially, that unemployment relief fund will have to be based on our calculations of how many people will come in. That will be the an original budget. But suppose that we are putting in the job guarantee tomorrow, and the, at the end of the year, we have a, another financial crisis. Right? And suddenly, uh, en masse, thousands and thousands of people are being laid off, and our budget doesn't allow us to employ those people. Um, even with a fixed budget, our, our approach is going to be superior to the Obama Recovery Act because we're already going to be employing a whole bunch of people. But of course, we want to employ all who need to, to, um, to come for work. So the model that we could use the counter-cyclical feature of funding the job guarantee is disaster relief, disaster emergency relief. That you know, when you know, five hurricanes hit the coastal area and FEMA has run out of budget, there is a supplemental appropriation that is uh, uh, provided to address those needs. So, I mean, this is, I mean, because I frame unemployment as an epidemic and because it has enormous social costs, I think um, it is 
useful to think of it as a disaster, right? As a disaster for the communities, for the people. And um, so we could potentially think about, um, okay, we could potentially think about uh, creating the job guarantee as part of the Stafford Act of 1988. Uh, and if we, if uh, the Stafford Act can quite provide emergency funding for the extra additional unemployed people, um, then we might want to pass legislation. But um, we already have a fund that exists on the books, and I think it's called the Disaster Unemployment Assistance Fund, that provides money to people who are rendered unemployed from, uh, from Harvey or Irma hur hurricanes, right, from hurricanes. So that already exists institutionally. So I'm saying, you know, just extend this to others, you know, who, from other disasters, financial crisis disasters you know, unexpected other events. Uh, and that could provide that buffer, that financial buffer uh, 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 funding mechanism. All right, so what else uh, can we do here? So what are the institutions that are gonna be involved here? The Department of Labor, um, state and municipalities, um, one jobs, one-stop job centers. <coughs> In 2012, the government already relabeled the unemployment offices. We call them job centers. They do everything except provide jobs. Right? They, so you can you go and you register and you say I'm an unemployed, and then you have to jump through a bunch of hoops to get your unemployment insurance. The state coordinates with the federal government to provide to provide the payment. So we already have a system of providing the checks. Like we don't have to engineer a whole new infrastructure for this whole thing. And so, uh, at the same time, those one-stop job centers provide training and education, assistance, one-on-one -on -one assistance with, you know, stress management and financial management, whatever, everything but a job. And so let's just make them true um, one-stop job centers, um, and they are pretty, and they're quite a lot in communities. <laughs> so they are on the ground, uh, local, and these centers can become the public jobs banks. Like these are the centers where it will be the um, the warehouses of the various jobs that we have already um, discussed with um, uh, various providers. And you know, others can come in and sort of apply to be providers for jobs. And we can continue to work within the community, institute some sort of bottom-up democratic process of providing jobs. Um, and use those centers of disseminating them. Um, so that is, you know, that's going to be the federal funding comes in the way it comes in with unemployment insurance. People come in to the unemployment office and they say, okay, I'm unemployed. And they tell you, okay, you can get unemployment insurance or we have a job for you. You can choose. If you get the job, you're no longer eligible for unemployment insurance, so that exp expenditure automatically <coughs> comes down. But you know, of course, nobody takes away your unemployment insurance. It expires within a few weeks anyway. And so if you decide to like, you know, stay on this meager check of unemployment insurance for a few weeks, by all means, you know, take some time off. But if you think it's not enough and, and you would like to, you know, come in the community and do something in the meantime while they help you with your resume and finding another job and all these other things, then we provide that opportunity part-time or full-time. And so that, that is, um, the question here would be who would be the employer of record? Um, you know, I would say the employer of record will be those institutions that are the providing the jobs, the libraries, the schools, the um, environmental groups that are doing cleanup, the community farms, I'll give you examples of, of what I'm imagining. And um, they could be the employer of record because, um, the lawyers can correct me if I'm wrong. I think we need legislation for federal hiring. I don't. I don't think that the Department of Labor can be the employer of record. Um, there, of course, there are federal jobs, but I don't think that you know, like creating a new deal, like a federal employees, like a, and a program of, of new new federal program will need a legislation, right? So uh, this is a question for the lawyers, and I'm uh, looking forward to you know some thoughts on this. Now. Okay. Finally, what what kind of jobs? You know, I uh, I'm imagining a national care act. So we we proposing sort of this broad term of national uh, care act of what kind of 
jobs we could do. You know, one thing I didn't, I did not say in the previous slide is that um, I have this proposal from a few years back that the the job guarantee could be run through nonprofits and social entrepreneurial ventures. So they could be the ones coming in, applying to be providers of jobs. What they what they can also do, you know, potentially is petition directly the Department of Labor and say, you know, write a grant and say, here's a project. Here's how many people I need. Here's the particular community <coughs> need that I'm solving. It goes through some sort of local approval, if you want municipal approval, and then goes to the Department of Labor. So you can have a completely bottom-up proposal approach from the communities themselves and maybe even the unemployed themselves. You know, if they organize, if they self-organize, and they say, here's what we need. We've got a lot of at-risk youth in this community. We're going to band together and create you know, a, a nonprofit to create a program. You can either go and work through these jobs banks or uh, or petition through a grant directly to the Department of Labor, and we can talk about the merits of whether this is a better or, or you know, worse uh, way of administering it. But when then we talk about um, how, uh, you know, what kind of jobs, uh, I'm envisioning a National Care Act, and here really we're talking about care for the environment, care for the people, care for the for the community. And um, you know the examples, there are you know limitless examples of the kinds of things that we can do. Actually, so I we can categorize them. Um, I think the uh, because of the urgency of the environmental pro problems, this could be our tree army, this could be the project that addresses this one acute social need. Let's go full steam ahead. Uh, and then we are going to categorize and create a taxonomy of monitoring programs, of rehabilitation programs, and public investment, putting in new investment programs. Um, and um, I don't know how much time I have, but I have so many like examples of what we can actually do. Um, <laughs> so, You've got eight minutes. I have eight minutes? Yeah, I mean the entire panel. Oh, okay, all right, so I have examples, and they are in the paper, and so when people, like, you know, go, go on Facebook and Twitter, like, what kind of jobs, you know, I, I, the first thing I say is look around and tell me what you want to have done, and the second thing is, like, if you don't have the imagination, come to me, and my friends, I think that, you know, we can come up with some ideas, and um, I, I have specific examples of what you could do in a mining community, what you could do in a wealthier community, and uh, etc. Okay, so I'll stop here. So thank you very much. Okay, well, we've got a little bit of time. Uh, I hope we might have more, but let's see. Quick questions, and we'll do quickest answers we can. First hand was there, there, and there. Okay, a uh, couple of comments from the question, Martin Watts, uh, Newcastle University. The question is to Randy, the fairly low-key one, and that is, I presume the poverty level is defined in absolute terms, is, is it? Right, yes. it's not relative. Okay, the comment for Scott. Um, I think talking about the cost of the job guarantee program is an example of bad framing. Cost to who? There's no cost to anyone. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I would be I said talking spending. about outlays by the federal government. Yeah, I would not be talking about cost because I think cost. Did I say cost? You did, yeah. yeah. Did my slide say cost? Uh, I'm not sure that you said this is very Anyway. Well, what I say and what I write are often to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just a uh, point that came up. I said spending and budgetary impact. Yeah, that's not good. Anyway, that's good. I detected a, a hint of, okay, we want to fit these JG jobs to the type of people who are wanting them. There was also reference to skills, and I think we've got to be very careful there because you start getting arguments from people who are hostile to job guarantees saying you really should have a differentiated JG wage according to skills. So it's something I think we need to be more careful of. Yeah, there are different job guarantee proposals. Ours is the same wage to everyone because it sets the basic wage 
uh, in the economy and the, the argument that high, people with higher skills should be paid more, yes they should, and the hope is they will be the first ones that are pulled out of the program. I have this order. You're all supposed to remember. Are you second? Okay. Yeah. Well, you go ahead. Go ahead. So just, um, so if you've got people uh, applying for these programs, how do you control or limit fraudulent applications? Fraudulent from whom? The people who, the jobless people? No, the people who supply, who claim to be providing jobs. How are you going to make sure that you know, 20 people don't get together and submit a, an application that sounds great, but it doesn't work. Every program has quality control. You, you have to vet them. You know, you have to see it's a legitimate thing. I, 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 what I'm trying to say is that um, there are, number one, community groups that already exist that are trying to serve the public good, that are understaffed and underfunded. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can <laughs> add supplementary labor force for them to do the work that they need to do. Number two, is that we can identify areas where we don't have enough providers um, to, to, do, to do the work. So, you know, I use this example of the food desert problem in the United States, where we could use more sustainable agriculture across all of our communities. And there are fabulous models of how this is done. Right here in Kansas City is my inspiration. The urban guys, we should invite them next year to our conference. With, from when they started to where they are today, they have done phenomenal work. They started with a community garden, and now they train ex-convicts, at-risk youth. They do um, a, 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 a tool library for the community. They've done countless things. And so what I'm saying is these things might not be there in other communities, and they might be done by people who are not officially in a nonprofit. So you will have to have some sort of quality control mechanism, but I don't think we should be discouraging this kind of entrepreneurial you know, solution to public problems. Right? So, uh, the way it's described, um, it sounds like with the sort of come and go situation where someone can come in um, and then a few months later if they find new work, they can get something else. But my question is, um, even though that's sort of an at will arrangement, it sounds like, would the, in, would the people that were actually working in the program be represented by a union? Uh, in the same way the federal employees, if it was a federally implemented top down sort of situation, would they be represented by a union? I think yes. If they organize, <laughs> every country is probably doing it. Right. Yeah. Really Kelly, I saw your right. hand next, and then we'll do one, two, three. Okay. My question draws on past discussions around conceptualizing a program such as this job guarantee, and I believe I recall one of the priorities of that's been uh, enunciated in the past is that a the, the program would try to be minim minimally disruptive of the private economy and private employers. And it seems that this construct, which includes a living wage and benefits, and I think even admit some of the participants would be drawn from the private employer group. Can you address that? That, that it seems to be fairly disruptive in some ways. Although, my, I love the program. <laughs> I, I love it in so many ways, and all of it would accomplish. But that element of disruption of the private employer group, can you comment on that? Well, we wanted to make this as, as big as possible. Okay, $15 an hour is, uh, there's a major movement around the U.S. In many cities, actually, it's not much of a disruption. The minimum wage is either legally or just necessary. Uh, it's close to 15 anyway, but you know, yes, we could have made the program smaller and said fewer <laughs> people would take it up if we paid eight dollars an hour. But we wanted to make it really big and show you it doesn't cause inflation. Okay, so it's not disrupting the macro economy, even with a very high wage. And you might say that there may be a benefit to disrupting some of the awful private sector jobs. <laughs> I think it's kind of a nice disruption to say now it's not just profitability that determines a viable business, it's contributing to the well being of your workers that determines whether or not you're a viable business. So, I'm going to disagree with that. I think it's disruptive because a lot of us who heard about the job guarantee community were under the impression 
Number one, that it would definitely be federal. This sounds like you're pretty much going to go out into private enterprise to find the jobs rather than creating federal jobs. We also thought there would be situations like where we'd be, you know, people who take care of elderly at home, people who are home care, people might have the opportunity to be supplementing as we pay people, hire people to do this. How about, how about we stay home and we give you that income to stay home as a, as you're not a federal employee, you can't offer them all this insurance and stuff. So I'm gonna tell you that right now. But, so that was a confusion, or people who perhaps were going to provide um, into the community music, art, theater, things we've lost that the, the BPA did for a while. So I don't hear that. I like the idea of helping a nonprofit, because we're a little nonprofit, we would love that. But um, So I'm asking that. And then if people are doing this as just a transition between being out of work and going back to work, Having a job that doesn't fit your skill is not going to help you get back to a job with your skill. Because they will look at you and go, well, you weren't doing anything for the last six months. That translates you back into that work uh, environment that you were in before. So okay. that might, be might do it better than being unemployed. Well, no, I, I'm not, I agree with you. I'm just <laughs> I mean, curious well, about Well, I mean, you have to remember, to... that's the alternative. The alternative to a job guarantee is not working. Well, I, I understand so. that. But we talk about it being a way to keep people's resumes Valid. So my first question is about the variations of jobs and definitions for different things, like I just said. And the other one is that transition, because for some people, in some jobs, that, that doesn't help them. It keeps them employed. Yes, that's great. It puts more money in their pocket. Okay, so I'm not sure what I said that, you know, uh, created the impression that I'm talking about private sector providers, because I'm not. Non-private is different. Um, I am talking about public institutions. Um, uh, that will be the providers. We're not subsidizing wages or providing, you know, we might have some apprenticeship programs for young people where they can go to, you know, I'm not entirely opposed to some participation from the private sector, but in general, these are public institutions. We're not and defining work. We're still in the state no, we, work we are in the kinds of things that we support. So, um, so because I didn't go through the examples, maybe that's where the confusion is. You know, when I say care for the people, you know, I, I exactly mean elder care, after school programs, special programs for children, veterans, mothers, at risk okay. youth, former inmates, the disabled. Um, the, you know, the, the benefit of this is that you're no longer the patient of a welfare policy. You are the agent of the welfare. So you are a veteran who is participating in this program for a veteran outreach, and you become the agent of change. So it's very, you know, truly yeah. participatory. Um, you know, the uh, other thing that I was going to say is that we can have a model, to, to your second question, of shadowing people. You know, very often people say, well, how are you going to create quickly jobs for all of these unemployed, you know, nurses or teachers? Well, how about we create a program of shadowing teachers and nurses? And that's your on-the-job training while you relieve the pressures of the teachers in our public schools and in our hospitals. And so it becomes both an on-the-job training that is suited to your interests and where you want to transition then to become a, you know, a public school teacher, you know, oh, get no, your certification. Not, and then if I had a job and I lost that job and eventually I want to go back to that job while I'm out of work for six months, when you go for an interview, they go, oh, well, you haven't been doing that job for six months, so you're away from that category. I, I understand, but it's not our obligation to provide, you know, uh, jobs, you know, you're an architect that you've lost a job and we are not our obligation to meet your, you know, your, your specific skill, but you are an editor and a lot of skills are transferable. So I don't think that there, we should even think that they, you know, somehow like it's got to be this particular job, but you are, let's say, an editor, but you're, you know, disabled. You can't go in the field and plant trees, but you can definitely help the city with, you know, some uh, communication, dissemination, creating maps, or whatever it is for the environmental agency. Okay. Like, there are skills that we can use, and we can fit those jobs to the people with their skills. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to cut it off uh, because the interview with Robert Skidowski is starting in four minutes in the studio <laughs> theater. Okay. And I know that you don't want this. So thank you. Thank you.